Well, it's a delight to be here. It's a delight to be back in New Zealand, and uh, I'm very uh, pleased to have been able to accept the invitation of the uh, Erskine program to come and be an Erskine Fellow uh, here in Christchurch. Um, some of you may have participated in this event. This was the march on uh, Saturday uh, in Christchurch, where uh, some 8,000 people wandered the streets of the city, including my wife and I. Um, with uh, various banners for, let me get the right point here, various banners for climate change wake up, and over here that says uh, climate action now. Uh, and I thought it was appropriate to uh, take this photograph against that lovely background of Antarctica and penguins. But the, uh, the proper title of my talk is uh, this rather elaborate title here. Uh, I'm going to talk about whether, climate, whether carbon emissions are changing the climate. It is a geologist's view because I was trained as a geologist and it has, uh, I mean, it in, it's intended to have a bearing on uh, you know, what they're going to be discussing in, in Paris. Uh, but what I'm talking to you about this evening is actually based on a book. Uh, this is it, if any of you want to have a look at a copy, Earth's Climate Evolution. Uh, is my book which came out in October this year and it discusses many of the things I'm going to talk to you about this evening. Uh, you can uh, see a, a background here uh, in, the, in the Alps. This is a melting glacier that you can see perched up here, once went down this valley, now has retreated. Plenty of signs of climate change in regions like the European Alps and also uh, here in your Southern Alps. So I'm going to start by going back to the late 1700s and the, the 1800s because many of the things that we now talk about as important uh, issues of climate change uh, were discussed and discovered uh, by scientists uh, late in the uh, 18th and uh, throughout the 19th century. One was the fact that uh, from the Cretaceous period 100 million years ago to now, uh, the climate had cooled. They called this the great cooling. They didn't have the vaguest idea why the climate had cooled, but it puzzled them greatly, and we'll have a look at that. They knew already in 1800 that sunspots were important. When there were more sunspots, the harvests were better. Uh, more sunspots means more heat coming to us from the sun. By 1830, they realized that uh, within individual continents or individual countries, like the UK, where some of their first early geologists were, there were changes through time in the climate represented in the sediments. And uh, they, they puzzled about that. They really weren't quite sure why that was happening, but we now have a very good idea what's controlling that. They also knew from the work of astronomers that the Earth's orbit changed with time due to the pull of the great gas planets, Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, they had a pretty, a pretty good idea of what was going on, but they weren't sure how it affected climate change. We now have a better idea of that too. By 1837, they realized that their, this cooling had led to an actual ice age in what we call Pleistocene time, that's the past 2.6 million years, uh, and that there had been great ice sheets uh, across northern Europe, and later it was found that there were also great ice sheets had been uh, across North America. By the uh, mid-1850s, they also realized that there had been another great glaciation back 300 to 250 million years ago in the what we call the Permian and Carboniferous times. Uh, in 1859, uh, it was realized that there were these things called greenhouse gases, that carbon dioxide and water vapor and methane and ozone all absorb infrared radiation and then re-emit that radiation into the atmosphere, which helps to explain why it's warmer than it should be. Uh, then, the, by 1896, that information had percolated into the minds of chemists and uh, one of them, Arrhenius in Sweden, uh, those long Swedish nights without any television, you know, nothing much else to do, you get your paper and a pencil out, and you, you, you create the world's first climate model, don't you? You know, what, what else could you be doing? Uh, and he was the first person to consider the role of carbon dioxide in the climate story. And then finally, by 1899, we actually had the first geological model of climate change. So our forebears in the science were quite canny people. They just didn't have enough even geological information to understand quite what they were looking at. They could see there was something there, but it was like in a fog and they were groping. So let's start with this bloke down at the bottom left. This is Charles Lyell. He's one of the most famous uh, geologists ever. 
um, eventually made Sir Charles Lyell and then Lord Lyell. His descendants still hold the baronetcy in Scotland. And uh, Lyell is one of the only two geologists buried in Westminster Abbey. Who's the other one? Darwin. Who? Darwin. Darwin, yes. Who was a mate of Lyell's. Now, um, Lyell knew from the work of the great German polymath Alexander von Humboldt that there were climate zones across the face of the earth. What Humboldt had done was he'd taken uh, temperature information from cities around the world in summer and winter and then joined up all the places that had basically the same temperature. And so he called these lines isothermal lines and they literally defined the Earth's climate zones at the time. And Lyell had this inspirational thought. He knew that the geology of the UK had changed climatically and so he thought, goodness me, well, if those climate zones had not moved, then the continents, Britain, must have moved across those climate zones. He came up with this lovely little sketch here. Uh, if all the continents were in tropical positions, we'd have very warm climates. If the continents were, however, in polar positions, we would have cold climates. He was really excited about this idea, so much so that he wrote to his friend Gideon Mantell. He said, I will give you a receipt. In those days, that meant also a recipe for growing tree ferns at the pole. That should sound familiar to New Zealanders. Uh, if it suits me, pines at the equator, Arctic walruses under the line, and crocodiles in the Arctic Circle. And he later went on to pen these words here, that continents, although permanent for large periods, shift their positions entirely in the course of ages. He just didn't know how they shifted their positions. We would have to wait a long time to find that out. And this is the man who helped us to find that out. This is the German scientist Alfred Wegener. Uh, Wegener was trained in the natural sciences. Uh, so he had some geology, some meteorology, some chemistry, all sorts of diverse background. And he earned his living as a meteorologist and a glaciologist. And one thing that specially struck him was this uh, matching between the coastlines of Africa and South America. So he, he started to collect information about the possible linkages uh, between the continents. And he found that there was lots of floral and formal information to show that these southern continents had been linked back through time. And uh, this reconstruction of, it comes from his 1920 map of the Carboniferous Coal Period 300 million years ago, when he deduced there had to have been a pole down here, probably in Antarctica, just off Durban in South Africa, and that the equator ran somewhere along this line here. But he had to fight for his ideas because they went against the grain uh, that had been set by this man. This is the Viennese geologist Edward Seuss. And Seuss uh, had also recognized there were these floral and faunal links between the southern continents. But what he thought was they'd always been in the same place and that the land between them had somehow sunk down to the ocean bed. Well, it seemed a rational idea at the time. Today, we would think that was nuts because the geology of the seafloor we now know is so vastly different from the geology of the continents. Uh, but he named this, uh, this link continents Gondwana land, and that's still a term we use for these uh, joined up continents here. Now, Wegener had the benefit of working with this man this is the world's first climatologist, Vladimir Köppen, uh, another German who came up with the first global climate system. He looked at humidity, rainfall, temperature, matched that to vegetation and came up with a, a great climate scheme. And so the two of them worked together. In fact, Wegener married, uh, married uh, Köppen's daughter. And so on these two maps down here, which come from they, their book they published in 1924, unfortunately only in German, they mapped the distribution of coals, which they thought represented human conditions, uh, desert sands, uh, indicators of ice, uh, salt deposits representing evaporitic conditions, and it, plant indicators, indicators of particular sort of geography. And so here you see two of the maps. On this one, I know you can't see the detail, but along you can probably see those little black dots. Those represent coal deposits, and so they put the equator along here. To either side of the equator, they found there were aeolian desert-type sands. Uh, this is uh, for 300 million years ago. 
and that those were associated with these evaporitic salts. And then around what they, where they thought the pole was, there were all sorts of indicators of ice. So they, they felt uh, comfortable in deducing that these lines were the probable lines of latitude, and that was the equator. And they further looked at the individual plant remains and found particular plants characteristic equatory regions along the postulated equator and this plant Glossopteris, uh, which is cool and hu temperate humid, scattered around the South Pole. So they had quite good evidence for this proposition. Uh, unfortunately, it went against the grain. Most geologists could not believe it because there was no mechanism to actually move the continents around. So uh, not until plate tectonics came along as a theory in the 1960s were we able to finally vindicate uh, their work. Just to give you an example of how plate tectonics can influence climate, uh, these two rather pretty maps, uh, by the way, come from a friend of mine, Chris Scottese. There's a website, www.scottese.com, where you can pull off uh, maps like this for any past time slice. And this one here is from the Miocene 14 million years ago. And what it shows is the positions of the continents at that time. And you can see there were gaps that allowed warm water to flow from the Pacific up around Africa, which had not yet barged into southern Europe to push the Alps up. There was a seaway through there. And then across into the Pacific through a gap, which is now the Isthmus of Panama. It didn't exist 14 million years ago. So we had this equatorial current system uh, that was distributing heat around the world. By the time we get to the Pliocene, three to five million years ago, things have changed quite radically. Africa has now barged into southern Europe, thrusting up the Alps and closing off the seaway between the Indian Ocean and the Atlantic. So the connection from the Pacific now has to come south of Cape Town up towards Florida. And then what happens? Well, this connection here has now disappeared because the Isthmus of Panama has uh, risen above the waves, and so that warm water now is forced to go north towards the polar regions. And the warm water here is forced south to the polar regions. And those changes cause radical, uh, radical changes in the polar regions. For example, in the south, that warmth melted the Ross ice shelf and parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet and the East Antarctic ice sheet. The globe warmed two to three degrees centigrade and sea level rose something like 15 meters globally. Uh, what we know about the Ross ice shelf comes from New Zealand led drilling through the Andrill uh, project uh, out near Scott Base. But at the same time, uh, the absence of this warm water flowing into the Pacific and the rising of sea level by that much allowed cool water from the Pacific to penetrate the Arctic and uh, come around Greenland and the new East Greenland current, isolating Greenland thermally and forming a major ice sheet there that then led to subsequent cooling. Now, another facet of climate change that I want to talk to you about and which we knew about, these guys knew about in the 1830s, is what I call the climate clock. This is where celestial mechanics is telling us about the behavior of the planet and the way in which that might control uh, the climate. And to that, we turn to this man. This is Milutin Milankovic, a Serbian engineer. And uh, what he wanted to do was to convert our astronomical calculations of the Earth's orbit through time into temperature data for the uh, surface of the Earth. And there are three things to bear in mind. One is the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. The other is the precession of the Earth around the orbit. And the final one is the tilt of the Earth's axis. Now here you can see that right now the Earth's axis is tilted at 23 and a half degrees, but um, 11,000 years ago it was 24 and a bit degrees, and it oscillates over a 40,000 year period between 23 and 21 degrees, and that affects the climate at particular places, particularly in the polar regions. Similarly, the position of the Earth right now in the northern hemisphere winter is quite close to the sun, which is uh, here. I'm not sure that you can see that all that well from the back of the room, but the sun, this is French, Soleil is there, the sun, and it's off center. You see the orbit is rather elliptical, 
and the sun is slightly off center, that's why we call the orbit eccentric. So right now, this, the uh, winter position of the Earth is here, and it migrates around the orbit in time. So in the northern hemisphere, we have relatively warm winters. And the summer position is over here, so we have relatively cool summers. But 11,000 years ago, the position was reversed. In the northern hemisphere, the, sum, the summer position was here, so we had rather warm summers, and the winter position was there, well away from the sun, so we had very cold winters. Uh, 11,000 years into the future, this, this position will be repeated. So we, we've moved from here to there, and we will move from there to here over an 11,000 year period. So what did all this mean for climate change? Well, what uh, Milankovitch realized was it was the amount of incoming solar radiation, that's 65 degrees north in the summer, which would dictate whether or not you had a glaciation in the northern hemisphere. He wasn't too worried about the southern hemisphere because Antarctica turns out to be covered with ice most of the time. But the great ice sheets have come and gone and come and gone in the northern hemisphere. And so he reasoned that at 65 degrees north, which is up somewhere near Oslo, or a little bit further north than Oslo, uh, over the past 600,000 years, uh, it was important to know how much insulation there was there because if you had a too little insulation in the summer, the snow would not melt. So here's his graph going, this is on the right from today, back over here to 600,000 years ago. And what he shows is a little triplet of cold periods here, a doublet of cold periods there, another one here, and another one there. Now, he worked closely with this fellow Kuppen. And Kuppen recognized from work done by Germans in the field in the Alps that there had been this sequence of glaciations. They just didn't know how old they were. They just didn't have very good geological dating. And what Koppen suggested to Milankovic was, wow, you've got this triplet, we see three glaciations in the field, then you've got a doublet, we see a doublet in glaciations, then you've got another doublet, we see one here, and you've got another doublet, we see one there. Maybe we found the missing link between the Earth's orbital changes in the amount of, of sunshine we actually get and the glaciations on the ground. So it was very, they were really very excited by this. It's unfortunate that too few people were able to get copies of the book, which was in German anyway, but this year it's now, the it's now been translated into English. So if you want to find out what they were talking about, you can get a translation. Now, we now move to the computer age when it becomes much easier to process all of this data and get results quite quickly. And that's where this man comes into the picture. This is the Belgian meteorologist André Berger. And what he did, did was refine all Milankovitch's calculations in the mid-1970s. So now we're going from a million years ago on the right to now on the left. And so there's the precession. You can see the 20,000 year signal of the precession of the Earth's orbit. There's the 41,000 cyclicity of the tilt of the Earth's axis. There is the eccentricity, which changes uh, with a repetition of about 100,000 years. And you can even see that that goes in humps. There's one big hump, there's another, and here's another. Those represent an underlying cycle of some 400,000 years. And what he did, just like Milankovitch, he took those three and combined them to find out how much solar forcing there was at 65 degrees north. So you, I'm afraid that the colors don't come out too well in this rather light room, but you can probably see them zigzagging around here. And the high peaks represent the warmest conditions. So you've got one, two, three, a doublet, four, five, six, and so on. And the geologists wanted to know, do our data match these astronomical calculations? So this man now enters the picture. This is Nick Shackleton from Cambridge, who used oxygen isotopes in little uh, planktonic creatures. And he had the advantage that by then we were drilling very long deep holes into the seabed to get great long cores that were almost undisturbed of the sedimentary record. So this is his analysis. He and two Americans analyzed the variability in the climate represented by those isotopic signatures. So here you have warm, cold, warm, cold. All of the up peaks here represent warm conditions, 
And sure enough, if you follow these up, you find that, that Berger's warm solar forcing signals coincide exactly with what Shackleton and his colleagues were finding in deep sea sediments. So just as Milankovic and Kuppen had found, or thought they'd found for those big glaciations in Europe there, we now had it nailed that they were indeed, those fluctuations were indeed represented in the sedimentary record. And that gave us tremendous confidence that the Earth's orbital properties were changing our climate and you could recognize it and date it in the geological record. Very exciting stuff. Well, exciting for geologists anyway. The next thing to do was to see, could we confirm that by looking at ice cores? If we drilled right down through a massive great thick ice sheet, like Antarctica, would we see these same signals? Obviously we should, but could we actually see them? So this drilling program began uh, up on the polar plateau uh, at, at a particular sort of high area called Dome C, and it was run by a group called EPICA, the European Program on Ice Coring in Antarctica. They had this, their drill rig in this big shed, so it didn't get too cold for them. In 1999, they started drilling, and down they went they had a few, um, they started earlier, actually in 1996, but they had to give up that hole. They then restarted in 1999, and by 2005, they got down to the bottom. That's 3.27 kilometers of solid ice core, which they could then take and put into a little trough, saw pieces off, send them to the laboratory, and have them analyzed. And so this middle graph in purple or pink shows you their uh, results, key results, and these are for temperature. So the blue line represents today's temperature in Antarctica, and the scale on the right, derived from the isotopes in the ice, goes back minus four, minus eight degrees. So that point there, uh, that's 20,000 years ago, was nine degrees colder in Antarctica than it is today. The time scale now, I'm sorry about the flip-flop of these time scales, but there is no standardization for geologists in publishing their graphs in the literature. So some have today on the right, some have today on the left. You'll have to bear with me. So uh, there we are, minus nine degrees. This is zero today. That's uh, 800,000 years ago. So this 3.27 kilometers of core took us back almost one million years. And what we can see is that most of the time, the climate was a heck of a lot colder, on average four degrees colder than it is today. It truly was an ice age. And it was punctuated by very short, brief, warm periods that we call interglacials. And we are now living in one of them right here. The interesting thing is these past four interglacials here, that's at about 120,000, about 200, about 300, and about 400,000 years ago. And what you can see even from the back of the room is that the temperatures at these four places were higher than today's temperatures in those warm periods by two to three degrees centigrade. Now the interesting question is if you've got very cold periods like 20,000 years ago, that's going to tie up a lot of water as ice. So your sea level should drop. So now we're going to look at the sea level, which is this bottom graph. And what we see, I hope you can see the turquoise curve from the back of the room. It mimics the temperature curve. So here we have high sea level today, very low sea level 20,000 years ago, rising to higher sea levels at these four points the same as those warm points there. That's 130 meters lower than today, so if you were in the UK, you could walk from London to Oslo across what is now the bottom of the North Sea. But what I want to draw your attention to, uh, again, you might be able to see this from the front row, but not from the back. The turquoise comes above the blue line of today's sea level at these points here. And it comes above it by between four and nine meters. So the past is trying to tell us something about the possible future. If we warm our climate by two to three degrees centigrade, we are likely to get, as in the past, a sea level rise of between four and nine meters. These changes, by the way, were driven mainly by those orbital changes. So these are the same changes that Shackleton was looking at in his deep sea cores. Now, what happened to Antarctica? Well, what you can see from this model is that 
uh, Antarctica grew out in, in uh, glaciations and shrank back, particularly West Antarctica, in those warm interglacial periods. It grew out in another glacial. It shrank back so much here that the West Antarctic ice sheet disappeared temporarily. Another glacial period. This is the time at the top. Going back into an interglacial, again shrinking, not completely lost. And then going out into the most recent glacial period there and finally shrinking back towards today's interglacial in here. It only gets me to 3,000 years ago, but that's not much different from what we see today. So massive changes experienced even in Antarctica during these um, changes due to the Earth's orbit. Now, we need to be able to measure past temperatures. And one of the ways to do that, as I mentioned before, is with oxygen isotopes. The, the great American chemist Harold Urey uh, realized in the 1950s, this is one of those you know, real leaps of the imagination. People at, at that time just began to understand about isotopes. And they realized there were two big isotopes of oxygen. One is oxygen 16, relatively light. The other is oxygen 18, relatively heavy. And he reasoned that if you form a water molecule that contains oxygen 16, it's going to evaporate preferentially to a water molecule containing oxygen 18. That's going to affect the composition, the isotopic composition of the surface of the ocean where the plankton live. So if the plankton are you know, processing that water, using it to build their soft parts and so on, you should see this signal in their remains. So uh, this guy, Cesare Emiliani, worked with Yuri. He was an Italian uh, chemist. And he used these little foraminifera, we call them, uh, planktonic foraminifera that graze on the grass of the sea. And uh, they contain these oxygen isotopes, which are measures of the sea surface temperature at the time they lived. And he started using them in cores that were about this long, because he didn't have access to anything longer. And he said to National Science Foundation, come on guys, we need really long cores. And that was the inception of the Deep Ocean Drilling Program, what we call the DSDP, where uh, for the first time the National Science Foundation paid for drill ships borrowed from an oil company to go out and drill holes in the deep ocean. And from then we got these, started to get these massively long cores that uh, Emiliani needed. So those were used by Shackleton and subsequently by this guy Jim Zakos from Santa Cruz in California who refined all of this uh, approach. And what we've got here is a curve. There are the oxygen isotopes along the top. These are millions of years now. So we're not now dealing with what Shackleton was dealing with, which is the past million years. Now we're dealing with the past 70 million years. And what we see down here in Zakos's data is that the bottom waters of the ocean uh, 65 million years ago were about 8 degrees centigrade. That's a heck of a lot warmer than they are today. They warmed up to almost 12 degrees centigrade 50 million years ago. And from then on, we saw this more or less steady decline to the present day when we have very cold bottom waters. This is what Lyle saw in the 1830s as the great cooling, just using fossils. So it's a very nice confirmation of the pattern. And right here on that cooling curve, that nick here is when the great Antarctic ice sheet first formed. We think I started to form an Antarctica around about here, little ice caps, and then they uh, it suddenly got cold enough for them to coalesce. And then we had an Antarctic ice sheet through here. And when it started to get really cold up there, we began to get the northern hemisphere ice sheet. So Antarctica has always been in the lead. So can we confirm this picture independently? Well, there at top left, that's Zakos' diagram. My orange line leads your eye. And this is the work here of this woman. This is Jane Francis, uh, a palynologist who looks at the shapes and characters of fossil leaves to determine what the temperatures were in Antarctica. I mean, can you believe that? Just seems amazing to me, but then I'm not a palynologist. And uh, this is Jane on a very bad hair day. Um, some of our lady students will be down in Antarctica. Be prepared for bad hair days. Uh, and there's the temperature scale along the bottom here. And Jane's graph is the 20 million years is the same as Zakos, 40 is the same, 60 is the same. She goes back even further than he did, back to between 100 
and 120 million years ago. And her fossil leaf data tell her that about 100 million years ago, temperatures in Antarctica were about 20 degrees centigrade on average. And then they decreased, just as he showed from the bottom waters, they decreased to about 7 degrees or 7.5 degrees by the time the first Antarctic ice sheet formed. So 100 million years ago, that's what Antarctica looked like. Uh, tree ferns like those you have in New Zealand, monkey puzzle trees, fir trees, little volcano in the background, and so on. So we have independent confirmation. The interesting point is, if you talk to an astronomer, he will tell you that stars like ours uh, gradually over time get more and more output. So our star should have increased its uh, radiation towards us by 6% over the past 600 million years. And what our geological data shows is that the temperatures have been cooling over the past 100 million years or so. So there's obviously something about the atmosphere that we hadn't been considering that we need to think about, and it is the greenhouse gases. It wasn't so this fellow is uh, the Frenchman, Joseph Fourier, a pal of Napoleon's. And he, um, I don't know whether you think he looks slightly conceited, but he regarded himself as the Newton of heat. Uh, but he realized cleverly that the air must be trapping the heat radiation from the surface of the Earth, so making the atmosphere warmer. He just didn't know how it was happening. He just didn't have enough information. We had to wait till this Irishman came along here. This is John Tyndall. And he used this wonderful apparatus here. I mean, uh, you know, you don't see apparatus like this in our laboratories today. No little flashing lights or anything like that. Quite different. Uh, he had a heat source in this box. Into this tube, he would insert a particular gas, let's say oxygen. And over here, he had a galvanometer, which registered whether that gas was absorbing the heat or not. Oxygen didn't. Nitrogen didn't. The ones that did are the other more complex gases in the atmosphere, water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, and ozone. So being the canny lad that he is, he deduced, therefore, that variations in these gases in the atmosphere could have produced, you know, we don't write papers with this kind of language anymore. Uh, could have, in the Victorian area, it was OK. You know, they could have produced all the mutations of climate which the researchers of geologists reveal. Isn't that nice? Uh, but it took a while for the geologist to catch up with his thinking. In fact, Lyle never did catch up with his thinking. We had to wait for the almost the 1900s. So here comes uh, Arrhenius, who we've already mentioned. He was a very eminent chemist. And his geologist, Swedish geologist pal, Arvid Hogbom, was fascinated by these changes from interglacials to glacials, interglacials to glacials. And he didn't like the orbital theory. So he wondered if it was something else, and he knew about Tyndall's work. So he said to Arrhenius, look, can't you get your chemical brain around this stuff? Can't you calculate for me whether carbon dioxide could do this for us, make those changes? So Arrhenius sat down, as I said, you know, long winter nights, no TV, and he calculated that if you lower today's CO2, that would be the CO2 of about 1890, by 0.6, you could lower the temperature 5 degrees. And if you doubled the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, you could raise the temperature by four degrees. And he named that his hothouse theory. Now, you know, nowadays we call hothouses greenhouses. So this is the origin of the greenhouse theory of climate change. This young man here, this beautifully bearded young man here, is the American geologist T.C. Chamberlain. And he was very much taken with Arrhenius' calculations. And he said, hmm, I can use that. And he developed a theory of climate change which he published in 1899. Volcanoes, he realized, pump out carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But mountains that get rained on are chemically weathered because carbon dioxide and water vapor create weak acids, and that absorbs carbon dioxide. So he had a source and a sink. And it was the balance over time between source and sink that would dictate whether the climate had enough CO2 in it to become warmer than usual. He also was familiar with new oceanographic information that told him if you had cold water, it would dissolve carbon dioxide and keep the climate cool. But if you had warm water, it would release carbon dioxide. All of these were really new ideas. We now 
take these for granted. And uh, he was the first person to deduce that the Carboniferous glaciation 300 million years ago was probably caused by all that coal formation. He reasoned, okay, you've got trees. They suck carbon dioxide out. They die, they fall into a swamp. The carbon dioxide can't go back into the atmosphere. Those tree remains are stuck in the sediment. And so what you're doing is you've created a new carbon dioxide sink. And that means you could cool the climate enough to give you a glaciation 300 million years ago. Well, geochemists are kind of important to this story, and this bloke here is particularly important. This is Bob Berner, and I'm sad to say he just died in uh, January this year. But Berner's game was modeling the Earth's climate cycles. He was fascinated by the nitrogen cycle, the phosphorus cycle, the carbon cycle, and he put it all together in, in a classic paper in 1983, uh, the title was The Carbonate Silicate Geochemical Cycle and Its Effect on Atmospheric Carbon Dioxide Over the Past 100 Million Years. He wasn't interested so much in, you know, tomorrow's climate change. He wanted to know how the climate changed over very long periods of time. And he eventually summarized all his stuff in 2004 in this lovely book, The Phanerozoic Carbon Cycle, Carbon Dioxide and Oxygen from Oxford University Press. And I recommend anyone interested in climate change, climate change should get that book and pay attention. This is how he explained it in the, what he called the slow carbon cycle in plate tectonic terms. So by now, we have plate tectonic theory. We don't have to worry about whether Wigan was right. There is a mid-ocean ridge. The seafloor on both sides is moving away from the ridge and volcanic activity is spewing carbon dioxide out into the atmosphere. When it gets into the atmosphere, mixes with water vapor, comes down as rain onto mountains, and it dissolves these uh, carbonate and silicate uh, minerals in the rocks. And that takes carbon dioxide down the rivers into the ocean. And in the ocean, those plankton that we saw before, they in effect are eating that carbon and forming skeletons made of calcium carbonate and soft parts made of organic carbon. Now, some, when they die, some of that's recycled in the water column, but some of the remains fall to the seabed and are stored as sediment. What happens in plate tectonics to those sediments? Well, uh, in this case, we have the mid-ocean ridge and the seafloor moving sideways on this side is moving down under an adjacent arc of islands. We call that process subduction. And the key thing to remember is that as you go down in the earth, it gets hotter. So those sediments melt, and they provide carbon dioxide to the volcanoes in that arc, and the carbon dioxide comes out into the atmosphere. This is the slow geological carbon cycle. You know what the fast carbon cycle is. Anybody like to tell me? What's the fast carbon cycle? All around us at the moment? Biology. Trees are growing, plants are growing, sucking carbon dioxide out of the air right now as we speak. And what happens in the fall when they die? They decompose, and the carbon dioxide goes back into the air. This is the fast carbon cycle, which we're not interested in here. So he was able to take his knowledge of plate tectonic processes and convert that into a picture of how much carbon there had been in the atmosphere over the past 600 million years. So there's today on the right, 600 million years ago on the left. You have a lot of carbon in the atmosphere, then it begins to drop out. We lose enough so that there's so little, we get a glaciation. Then as uh, that Gondwana continent starts to split apart, we get more volcanoes, put more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. We get the growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And eventually, mountains like the Himalayas start to form and suck the carbon out of the atmosphere, taking us to where we are today in another ice age. A very interesting story. But here's a particular example that illustrates the general, the general truth of the uh, carbon story, the carbon cycle story. It's what I call the climate catastrophe at 55 million years ago. And this may be something we could consider as an analog for tomorrow. So along the bottom of this uh, graph is the 56 million years to 55 to 54 million years. And what we're interested in is what happened at 55 million years ago. Clearly, you can see something went on. 
Now, uh, I'm not all that clever with manipulating PowerPoint, so I couldn't get this deep sea core of Jim Zakos's to go horizontal. So you'll have, to, you'll have to believe me, this bottom part of the core, the deep sea core, is full of carbonate, and that's, those are the values there in that core. 90% calcium carbonate, very rich in those sedimentary carbonate remains. Then suddenly all the carbonate disappears, you get this red clay, so the carbonate values there drop to zero, and then after a little while, about 100,000 years, the carbonate starts to come back in, and eventually we end up with the same values as we had at the bottom, and so there you see that recovery back to those normal values. Now Zakos wanted to know have I got anything in the isotopes that will tell me what was happening to the atmosphere? So we analyzed the carbon isotopes. So here we have a carbon isotope ratio. This is between carbon-12 and carbon-13. And it's fairly stable. And then suddenly, uh, carbon-12 comes in massively, gives you a huge signal, then a recovery back to normal. Now, carbon-12 comes from marine organic remains. And it's most likely that that comes from some a marine sediment source on the seabed that got disturbed and it put large amounts of carbon into the atmosphere. More than a thousand gigatons, and a gigaton is a billion tons. So if you put carbon dioxide in the temp into the atmosphere, the temperature should rise. Did the temperature rise? Yes. With oxygen isotopes, he could show that the temperatures then rose by five to six degrees and then declined back to these normal values. So what is going on down here in this bottom graph? What are we looking at? If you put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, it exchanges with the ocean. That makes the ocean more acid. It's the acidity of the ocean that then dissolves the calcium carbonate and gives you just red clay. So this is an ocean acidification signal that tells us it confirms that large amounts of carbon went into the atmosphere just as he showed. And incidentally, uh, measures of sea level show that at this time the sea level went up by about 12 meters. So we have another message in the rocks which tells us if you put large amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, you can expect your temperature to rise, you can expect your ocean to become more acid, you can expect your sea level to go up by a significant amount. Is anybody listening? Just to show you that there is a good relationship between carbon dioxide and temperature in the ice cores, this is the temperature scale from isotopes. And what we're looking at here is the amount of carbon dioxide in the bubbles of air in the ice cores. These are the values from 180 to 280 parts per million, and we see quite a nice relationship. Why are there two curves here? Well, it's because we wanted to look at the youngest ice and the oldest ice to see if there was any difference. There isn't basically any difference. This is from that same dome sea core we looked at before. Now, some of you reading around the subject may have come across the observation that in these ice cores the carbon signal is delayed after the temperature signal by up to about a thousand years. That's the way it used to be thought, but recent analyses by a French group led by Frederick Perrinin show that if you take Antarctic ice cores and you merge all of the temperature data like this core here, you merge it all into a stack uh, from the last glacial maximum 20,000 years ago up to about 10,000 years ago, you see a rather a nice set of changes, which I've, and I've ri ringed the inflection points. And when you look at the carbon dioxide, you find the carbon dioxide changes are at the same place. So the carbon dioxide is changing not in delayed mode, but at the same time as the temperature, which is what you'd expect. If you were a physicist, you would expect that as you warm the ocean, carbon dioxide would come out. And that is now what the ice cores do show. So we're going to go back now to our core. There's the temperature data you saw. There's the sea level data you saw. There's the carbon dioxide. And you can uh, drag up. There's the high temperature, high carbon dioxide, high temperatures, high carbon dioxide, all the way through. The carbon dioxide mimics the temperature. In this case, it's not like plate tectonics. Here what's happening is the orbit is changing the temperature. And because the water temperature is changing, the carbon dioxide is either coming out or going back into the ocean. 
So the orbit's the main driver. But when you put carbon dioxide into the air from the ocean, there's a feedback to the temperature. So what you end up with is a much faster rise of temperature than you should get from these orbital curves. You see these are all very regular orbital changes. That's not regular, that's very asymmetric. And the reason it's asymmetric is because the orbital signal is reinforced by the carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. This carbon dioxide follows what we call a natural envelope between 280 and 180 parts per million. Where are we now? This is where we are now, up here. So we're well outside the natural envelope of almost the past million years. Now, I want to talk now about the sun itself because it's an important part of the driver for our system. The sun gives us most of our energy. What I've talked about so far is how solar energy is modulated by what's happening in the Earth system. So here's another modifier. When you get lots of sunspots, then the solar wind, the ejected plasma is strong. So there's the sun, there's the solar wind, comes towards the Earth, and this is the Earth's magnetic field, and it's just as well it's there because it deflects the solar wind. And the solar wind is important because it deflects cosmic rays from outer space. When those cosmic rays do impact the outer atmosphere, they zap into nitrogen, knock spots off it and create carbon-14 and beryllium-10 isotopes. We find those in tree rings. We find them in ice cores. So we can use those isotopes in Earth materials to tell us about the behavior of the solar wind in the past. That's really mind-blowing, mind-blowingly fascinating. Well, to me, anyway, as a mere geologist by training. So, yeah, okay, there's the variability in the solar wind. You see cold periods here, you see warm periods, and that's the envelope of solar change. This is the sunspots themselves. So in the 70, uh, 1780s, high values, 1860s, high values, no higher than recent values. Today's values are in decline. We cannot blame the current rise in temperature on these declining outputs from the sun. So where do we go from here? I'm going to jump over the next graph and uh, these global warming graphs. I'm sure you've seen them all before. I'm going to go to this one. We see the carbon dioxide in the ice cores here over the past thousand years and we see it rising since about 1769. That's when James Watt patented his steam engine. So we, we need somebody to blame, so we'll blame him. It's all his fault. Uh, everybody wanted to have one of his steam engines, but the important thing is that rise we see in the ice cores matches onto what we're now measuring in the air. We are now putting 20 parts per million into the atmosphere in a decade, uh, whereas nature did it 20 parts per million in a thousand years. So we're doing it a hundred times faster than nature. So this is my la almost my last slide. Here we see the orbital change. So 20,000 years ago, the last glacial maximum, the orbital influence the insulation rises, then it starts to fall and it falls into what we call the little ice age of the past 500 years and it's going to stay there. So our climate should be in a continuation of the little ice age. Clearly it's not. What happened to carbon dioxide? The green lines are 180 to 280 parts per million, that's the natural envelope of the past 800,000 years. Carbon dioxide is now whacked up here and we know what it can do to temperature. So we should still be in the little ice age, and it's that greenhouse warming, we cannot find anything else, which has pushed us outside the natural envelope of climate change, which should keep our temperatures cold. So to conclude, I'll jump to this one then. To summarize, carbon dioxide change can make the temperature change. We saw that 55 million years ago. But carbon dioxide change can also be caused by uh, temperature change as it was in the Ice Age. Both of these involve positive feedback. Plate tectonics is important. It provides us with carbon dioxide source. Its mountain building provides us with a carbon dioxide sink. Orbital change provides us with that external source of heat. That forces the ocean to release carbon dioxide and warms us. But that effect is smaller than this one. Finally, the solar output also changes within this natural envelope, but its effect is smaller again. So where are we now? 
we're above the natural envelope of carbon dioxide of the past 800,000 years. Our temperature is now above the natural orbital and solar envelopes of the past 2,000 years, and it's rising along with carbon dioxide and sea level. So my interpretation of all these data is that the geology tells us that putting more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere will warm us more, raise our sea level, and acidify our ocean. And I didn't use any climate models to get there. <laughs>